Tony Bolden, um, African American. All right. Now, let me see, before let's get started, I'm about to read the biography, but first I want to say it is a, an honor for me to be able to read her biography because she's someone from the house. Being that I'm a Morehouse man, I take a lot of pleasure in reading her biography. Okay. Dr. Let me introduce Professor Chloe Claiborne. She previously was a professor at Harvard University and Claflin University. She is currently a professor of English and American Literature at Morehouse College. She received her undergraduate degree in English from Syracuse University, an MA in English from the University of South Carolina, and doctorate from the Ohio State University. She has often written about the role that black women play in popular culture. Her essay, The Bride Piece, um, Investigating Black Women in Materialism, was published in 2003 in Sometimes Rhythm, Sometimes Blues, Young African American on Sex, Love, and the Search of Mr. Wright by Steel Press. Moreover, she has lectured extensively about African American culture and literature, as evidenced by her conference papers, Globalization Identity and the Hip Hop Aesthetic at the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia, July 6, 2008, and Narrative of Love, Loss, and Marginality Among Black Women at the MELIS, Society for the Study in Multi Ethnic Literature of the United States Conference in uh, Florida in April 2008. I mean, April 28, 2006, excuse me. In 2010, she partnered with the Myrtle Beach Museum of Art and the Richland County Library to deliver a series of lectures about the similarities between the quilts of Gee's Bend, Alabama, and the cultural artifacts of South Carolina and Low County. Dr. Claiborne served on numerous boards and committees as a part of the Claflin faculty, including the Claflin University Journal of Undergraduate Scholarship, the South Carolina State University Interdisciplinary Scholarship Journal, and the short story editorial boards. She was also an affiliate faculty for the Jonathan Jasper Wright Institute for the study of South Southern African American history, culture, and policy at Claflin University. <clears throat> In 2009, she was awarded a UNC of Mellon Fellowship at Harvard University. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, would you all please join me in welcoming Professor Corey Corey Claiborne. I didn't know you were going to read the whole thing. <laughs> you know how you shoot something to people like, OK, just pick and choose, send it out of there if you want to introduce me. Um, at, I don't mean to interrupt you. Do you mind if you cut the lights? It'll actually be better for me. I know. That's fine. OK, so um, to give you a little backstory, so the title of my paper is Teaching Text and Technology, which I'm sure a lot of you already know a lot about. Um, the subtitle, Reading African American Literature in the Digital Age, I think particularly comes from being in this space, um, you know, teaching African American literature, but being at Morehouse College, where there's always sort of a question about, um, does it matter, right, how you deliver the text to people who are largely African American, largely male, like so to already have, um, I don't want to say ownership in the literature, but I guess that's what I'm going to say, because I don't know what else to say about that, but already start to have ownership in the literature, but you know, there is a sense of it being a different time. I mean, the reality is at Morehouse um, that the students are coming in with a very different sense of what it means to read and participate in reading text than what the faculty have. A lot of my colleagues have been at Morehouse for 40, 50 years, and it's a challenge to get them. You know, they were there when Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was this great person, um, was there. They were there like when Martin Luther King was there. So they have a very different notion. I mean, they don't return email, things like that. So they're not trying to participate in the digital age. But what Morehouse did is that they basically had 40 iPads that they gave to faculty, and they wanted to challenge them with. How can, to, well, basically they were challenging them to see if this is something that Morehouse wants to adopt and use in their teaching. Since I was already using iPads and digital technology in my class, I got, you know, asked, well, not really asked, but sort of forced to be, but it's, it's actually, I'm proud to do it, be the head of this digital initiative for, particularly in the humanities, but really sort of college-wide. So the question really was two things. How can we first create content, which for a lot of people was the issue. I mean, this idea about digitizing things. Um, one of the things I mentioned about being here 40 or 50 years and these sort of illustrious people who have been at Morehouse, um, one of the uh, faculty members in philosophy and religion just came to me and was telling me that Howard Thurman, who's this sort of, this person who, you know, taught Martin Luther King and who uh, wrote all these um, uh, sort of great books that people talk about all the time, he was saying in the philosophy and religion department, literally they had manuscripts from Howard Thurman moldering 
and boxes and the reel-to-reel -reel tapes that nobody had done anything with and they were just like, well, what happens if they just disappear because they're just hot <laughs> sitting there? And so, you know, some very real challenges, I think, um, about how to, first of all, what to do, like what could he do in that particular situation um, with the kind of, um, well, I don't want to say the reticence for technology, but, but the, we have, Morehouse hasn't really sort of embraced it. So what can he do on his own before, you know, grant money just to make sure that he could make these texts available and make sure that they weren't lost in some ways? I mean, I didn't know how to archive them, but I could tell them how to, you know, copy them and things like that. All right, so uh, that's a little bit of backstory about Morehouse. All right, so today, um, what I want to talk to you about really is, you know, teaching text and the way that I do that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that I um, have developed and shown uh, faculty at Morehouse. Um, and then I also want to talk about some other things that I use and the way in which I see, you know, really all of literary studies moving, which is this multimodal sort of um, call and response, if you want to call it that. Um, way of reading. So I use a couple of uh, sites all the time. One I'll talk about a little bit more, which is Storify, um, which is really important. And you, if you want to go and follow me on that link at storify.com, Professor Claiborne, the visible African American text, I'm going to come back to that several times and I'll actually show you the web page for that. If you are on Twitter, how many people are on Twitter? See, that's one of these kind of things. Either people are on it and they hate it or they. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. So if you are on Twitter, well, actually, if you're not even on it, if you have a web uh, uh, laptop, you can just go to the, uh, the address tweetchat.com slash backslash room backslash teach text, and we're going to use that to sort of have a discussion today. So the hashtag for today, if you are on Twitter, is teach text with an S. Make sure that it's with an S because if it's one, it's something else. And then if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Claiborne Girl. Professor Claiborne is usually what I use for my classes, so that may or may not be interesting to you. It's like, you know, your papers do, like that kind of thing. So <laughs> if you want to follow me there, you can as well. All right, so background questions. I mean, these are sort of questions that I think we, that are general questions about the digital humanities that are useful here as well. Okay, so, and actually I would like for you to participate. Definition um, a few days ago for a soundbite. So uh, I think what I said is that it is the application of technology um, to um, to the humanities in terms of the interface. Okay. Interface between humanities and technology. Okay. Um, and I think that was what I came up with. And so it's not so much um, you know. I guess I was trying to get away from the focus on the technology, but to say it's the interface between the two. Right, between and I definitely think that that is the case. It is interface, and another way that I like to say is it's conversation. Um, and then, well, we can go on. So just think about the other two. So what is digital humanities? How is reading changed um, at all in the digital age? And what does all of this have to do with you? Which is ultimately the question that we all had at the end. Um, all right, so digital humanities, in some ways, is a lot of what we do that you are already doing in the history of black writing, right? Um, it is about archiving and cloud storage. Really, that's sort of the issue. That is the issue with my colleague at uh, Morehouse. Like, he has all this stuff. How can he uh, store it, right? How can he put it on the cloud so that people have access? Um, and how can he make sure that he has a good sort of archive and he's able to tell the story about, for example, how it started? So uh, the history of black writing already does this. And I think that that's an important starting point, but I think that the digital humanities is sort of growing out of that. And um, primarily because, not to say, I said the old notions of digitizing the humanities, but beyond really this idea of taking text and digitizing them, because that's really sort of a question for access, but beyond giving access to these things, how are we actually changing the humanities with what we do in our sort of digital lives? Right? And I think that that's the news question. And for people like um, 
some of the people I work with at Morehouse, I mean, who don't want to participate in this sort of digital initiative at all, my um, ultimate um, you know, thing for them is that you already are. It's not, I don't believe that digi digital humanities is something that you do. It is something that is happening. That you can either recognize or not recognize. But the, the real opportunity comes from the way that you recognize that and the way that that then goes into your own scholarship and teaching. So, all right. So how has reading changed? Um, and this is kind of interesting. You know, if, if you've ever been to a black church, what they will do is, you know, they have these moments where the preacher will read parts of the text and then they'll say, well, then turn to your neighbor, right? And then say, ask your neighbor, you know, or say to your neighbor, you know, something like, how does it feel to be Job or something like that? So I'm going to say the same thing for you. And this is like participatory because it's good. So ask your neighbor, turn to your neighbor. And then some people can report to me on Twitter if that's what you want to do. But if not, I'm going to come back and ask you to ask your neighbor how has reading changed. And if it hasn't changed at all, then just say that. So very quickly, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> I think reading has changed because it's made more
So this is one of those kind of things. So, so you know this, like how, how does this change like your sort of philosophy of teaching at all? Or if you're a student, how does this change the way that you're looking at that? I mean, one of the things is we can go and sort of just look at, oops, we can go and um, look at, It's like, it's asking me for precision. This is why I like to do it for my iPhone. Uh, is this one kind of open? Oh, <laughs> um, so one of the things is that what you see a lot at conferences is that a lot of times, and I don't know how fast the internet is, so I apologize already, that um, it's live. So when I ask people to tweet and everything like that, so you know, you can see everybody's responses. And then the thing is that that goes into what you call the back channel uh, in terms of conversation, right? And there's all those that have a quote from Professor Clifford, I've tweeted from a great workshop. I appreciate that. So, so one of the things is that how do you deal with that sort of back channel? Now, you can be like most people and sort of ignore it, but I think for the exciting um, opportunities in digital humanities is to sort of use that in terms of your narrative. And you can see stuff that I, you know, I was tweeting, I pre-tweeted just in case, because you never know how technology is going to work. So I just, some links that I'm going to talk about later when we're looking at um, uh, the uh, literature specifically. So we'll come back to this. So back channel is really important too. I mean, the sort of thing that's already <laughs> happening, whether you um, want it or not, and like how do you acknowledge that? All right, I was talking to Kenton about this. I, I just wanted to mention this as a, as a sort of like experiment that I did and sort of what led me to come to this uh, conclusion about digital humanities is I was on this panel uh, earlier, was it this month? It was this month or last month. I can't remember, it's been all of our, <clears throat> talking about, you know, how to do literary and psychological readings of hip hop, right? So the students, this is a student generated conference uh, they were the ones who wanted to talk about this, and then because they felt like I was the one professor that would be sort of down with doing this, not necessarily the ones who've been there 15 years who are great, but they might not want to talk about Jay-Z, I was the one they picked. So, um, and then what I kind of realized then is I kind of really talked about the postmodernists of hip-hop, and really the postmodernism of all literature and reading. And what that basically means is that everything is dialogic. So everything, as I said, is in conversation with each other, which is one of the you know, uh, primary things about postmodernism. And so what I discovered for a lot of my students is that they got to Jay-Z through somebody like uh, you know, James Baldwin, which to me was so fascinating. Like That helped them understand. Like We were thinking that they were sort of two just totally disparate things, but you know, they sort of could, they had really like the student papers were like sort of really cogent readings of Jay Z when they were talking about literary theory and fire next time and all this other stuff. And I and I and I said that even if I didn't make the connections in class when I when I taught, I realized the students were making those connections already. That was the type of reading that they were participating in. So it was a really good um, conference. I love that poster too. Which I didn't make one of the students made. All right, let's see if it'll go. All right, and so one of the things I talked about, whoops, let me go back one, is uh, Jay-Z's book, Decoded. How, how many people have seen that? Which is like this great, amazing text. And I basically said, the, uh, Decoded is Jay-Z's opus to postmodernism. It's a book that's intertextual, making frequent references to other works. It's dialogic in conversation with other works of literature in our meta-narrative, and that it is, is self-reflexive, meditation on his craft, and it is deconstructive. In fact, Jay-Z uses the word decode instead of destruct, deconstruct, but essentially he's doing the same thing, analyzes, analyzing his own work in order to show its contradictions. You know, however, what the book reveals is that his music has already, always already been deconstructive. And I think that, you know, the, the cover of uh, Decoded is so interesting, it's the Andy Warhol Rochon, um, and it's this idea that he's sort of really looking deeply into his identity that I think was really interesting. I, and then one of the things I wanted to point out too that is Decoded, which is a book that you can buy, is also an app that you can get in the iTunes store. And you can basically read parts of uh, what he does here is break down different verse lyrics. Um, and he 
gives the context, like for example, the Che Guevara, some other different things here, and you can press on it. Of course, it's a way for him to sell more music, because you can, if you want the full version, with all the, you know, you can listen to and everything else, you gotta pay more money. But it's this sort of very neat way of talking about the way that I think a lot of students are reading now. So the app is neat. Um, I didn't pay for the full version, so I can't really talk about that. All right. <laughs> All right, so finally we're going to get to what we're talking about today, which is Larry Jackson's My Father's Name. And you might say, well, what in the world does that have to do with decoded? Those are two totally different types of books. They're talking about different things. They're in different time periods after the Civil War. And of course, this you know, sort of new postmodern, post-black you know, sort of treatise. But ultimately, I think that they're doing the same things in a lot of ways, meaning that you know, the central question that I understood from um, Jackson's book was, you know, this, this question about identity. He's thinking about, you know, his giving his son a name, the name that his uh, father had and his grandfather had, and how do you trace that, how do you decode, right, naming, really? And so what I did when I was reading this, and it's the same thing that we all do when we read something, is that we take notes, right? But I had both the e-version of the book, and I had a, a galley copy that you so nice to get me before, and what I realized was that I was reading in two ways. Like, I, I read the hard copy, but then I would go back and find ways to engage with the digital copy. And so what I did was I created what, a story really out of that in something called Storify. And I'll just basically show a little bit of it to you. Of course, mm -hmm. just for the benefit of people here. Uh, Lawrence Jackson is in the house. Yeah. So I just want to, I know he wants to be, uh, not necessarily fully identify the day, but he does speak at 3.30, but you can stand and just say hi to everybody if you want to. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> you get to do it at Paris, that's what I like. <laughs> all right, so he is here, and this book is great. Both, all of his books are great. So. Um, all right, so this is a very neat thing, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later, but I just wanted to show what it looks like. Um, and so one of the things I start off, and I was talking about the visible African American text because if I started thinking about this. I said, this story is about how to make narratives that African American people tell live. Of course, that is what the tradition of storytelling has always been. Oral passed down through generations and replete with what Zona Hurston calls colored people's will to adorn. Our, our stories are created with each retelling, much like social media jazz or hip hop. Our narratives need to be remixed, improvised, and constantly responding to the surrounding world. And then I just give like sort of the little uh, background. And one of the neat things about this is that, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, is that you know, Storify is a way to put together all your social media. So Twitter, Facebook, um, if you go on Amazon, uh, Instagram, which is where I took a lot of the, uh, the um, pictures from. And so I did say that everything I did for this presentation was on the iPad. So one of the things with the, the challenge that I gave the Morehouse faculty is that you should not have to go anywhere else. Like you should be able to be on your iPad and do everything you need to do in terms of your scholarship and research, at least ultimately that should be the case. I mean, besides going in the library, which I still do, but I'm just saying that in general. <laughs> and what's so neat is that you can, but it's a way of sort of curating um, all this information. Like for example, if I, hopefully this will work, if I hit on this, it'll take me to the book trailer for um, my father's name, let's hope it works. <laughs> which, And I'll just show you a little bit of this, because he's going to talk about the book, and I don't want to give anything away. But it's so neat. But it's the idea that you have all of these things um, together in one place that becomes sort of like a really useful uh, thing. Let's see if it comes up. It might not. Internet. All right, well, if it doesn't, but we'll show it. You can yeah, always go back on. <laughs> so say you could go back on the um, on my Storify page. It's all there. You can obviously search it through YouTube. Um, go to Emory University's page. Let's see. Is it paused? Why is that the internet? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's scrubbing. 
so it's not going to show. But anyway, it's him. He looks lovely. Talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you could go. We could go back and look at it later. <clears throat> All right. Let's go on. All right. So one of the things that I said that you know, reading in Storify. Um, oh wait. Let me go back and show you one thing in Storify before I go on. <clears throat> Is that I realized that this was sort of. Um, an active engagement because my father is from, um, some of you met, is from Danville as well. And so I already had a narrative and a story about Danville to go along with his. And so, and I thought that that is how people read. Like you bring your own memories, your own subjectivity, all of those things. So, you know, within that, you know, I put some stuff about the civil rights, um, you know, Danville, the last capital of the Confederacy. This is a picture of uh, Annabelle Claiborne, who's my great, great. Mother. I forgot his name. Another clay board. Simon. Simon, thank you. And um, my dad, who, um, <coughs> you know, had his own, uh, he becomes like this sort of uh, mythical figure. I think of Davo whenever we go back because he was this, you know, the first black athlete to uh, play at Duke University. And so he, when, whenever people go back, they're like, yeah, you went out and in integrated. Like they have this sort of very interesting. Um, because he didn't want to. I mean, I think that, you know, that's what Jackie Robinson said, you know, integrating into the league is never an easy thing. Like, he didn't want to do it, but he sort of understood that for black people, he was representing and he had to be this model minority, which he did very well. So that's his story, and um, um, anyway, but anyway, you could call all this things together. We're talking about dialogic, et cetera, from Wikipedia, and you can put it all in one place. All right, so let me go, because I think I'm talking way too long, so I'm going to hit. Go back to this and um, okay. So I think that there are very uh, clear connections between um, uh, decoded and even something talking about the Civil War and Black people in a certain space and a certain personal narrative, which I think is also a history. So one thing I do a lot too is if you have an ebook, especially in Kindle, you can tweet certain parts of the book. Like they'll do that from the app like you just go in and hit it and so this is a good way to start conversation like on my own right so for even for people who haven't read the book so i i put something about naming practices discuss and teach text right because i knew i was coming here and then the quote is basically um in roughly uh, the century and a half since slavery these common names evidence of unrecognized and unrecognizable loves have become tribal even when they are ordinary, we make something of them and the story that they tell because human beings are uh, past making machines, right? So ultimately, like, it began, I started thinking about names, and he was talking about his own name, like, so the Jackson being this common name um, and what that means, right? And then, so this is the actual text from um, the Kindle, which you can highlight, make notes on, etc. And I wanted to show that this is sort of another means of being very fairly intertextual. Like, so he's mentioning Song of Solomon here, that if you remember the very beginning, it says so that the fathers may soar and the children may you know, know their names, right? There, and then uh, Larry mentions that there's a scene like this in the Toni Morrison's novel talking about going back and trying to reclaim identity. <coughs> uh, Song of Solomon, the lead character, Milkman Dead, arrives back in Shalimar, the town of his long lost grandfather, Solomon, who is the key to the man's ancestral past and the originator of the family myth of slaves falling back to Africa. So, I mean, he's talking about his own journey going back from North Carolina, he's driving from North Carolina to um, Virginia and how that reminds him of his journey about uh, in Song of Solomon. And I sort of immediately was like, oh yeah. And I, and I thought about the way I would teach this to my students who may or may not have read Song of Solomon, right? Like, how do you explain to them that moment? Right? So, but then you have, wonderful, like you're on the iPad, you have all this stuff there, you have the text, you can bring up Toni Morrison, you can sort of link all of those things, like construct her world of Virginia as well, and talk about that sort of naming practices, which is one of the things that um, I want to talk about today, just very briefly. So, um, and then this is like for if we were, we are, but, like, so if we were in class, this is one of the things I would ask. I would show the sort of clip of Morrison. I would show uh, the parts of the text uh, from Jackson's narrative. And I would say, well, what do you think about naming, right, and Jackson's and Morrison's work? Like, how does that, uh, how does that construct itself? And then 
there would be a chance for you, which you can't participate in, I mean, to talk about your own name, like, and how is that important, and how does that enter into the conversation? A lot of the sort of anxiety, um, and I think I talk about this later, too, um, some of the anxiety uh, is this fact of what of whether or not you have a white person's name, right? My name is Claiborne, which uh, you know, which is so interesting. I, I saw it a couple places in the narrative. Oftentimes, when you go to the general store that the white people owned, it was like Claiborne and Jeter was the name of the store. And people know Liz Claiborne, who's actually from that area, which I don't think I'm any kind of. I can't trace our relations, but I'm sure it's not good. But so, like, so the anxiety of having that uh, this sort of white name, right? But he quotes Ellison in saying that maybe perhaps this was um, actually sort of like an affirming thing. He says, uh, Ellison says, uh, complex adaptation that African Americans had made after slavery, naming themselves like the educated Booker T. Washington for presidents and the like. Perhaps taking in the aggregate these European names, which sometimes with irony, sometimes with pride, but always with personal investment, represent a certain triumph of the spirit, speaking to us of those who rallied to be assembled, transformed themselves, and who under disremembering, dismembering pressures refused to die. So, I mean, Ellison having very different saying, well, maybe the people who had these white people's names, right, that's like this empowering act. They were taking that. And so I would, you know, use this as a way of sparking conversation because one of the things when students read, especially, like they tend to tweet me like at night, right? Like, oh, I'm reading this, like what's going on here? And then this is just a way to say, well, it's not always so simple as having a white name is like a negative thing. How, how, you know, this is what Ralph Ellison said, how can you think about that in another way? All right, and then like this is another thing about more on naming. Uh, they talk about the fact, uh, particularly in African American traditions, like giving uh, people names that, that are deeply uh, defiant and that against sort of like the white people's names. And he mentions at the bottom, like Suki, Dr. Phoebe, Lucy, Morning, or Shaquille, right? Or I think he said Lakeisha was an example of that too. I mean, just a way to um, um, uh, tease that out. Okay, so this is uh, his. Uh, grandfather, Nathaniel, right? And uh, so it's so interesting having the picture there. You know, I love his hair. I was thinking that that was so great. I mean, to have that sort of reality, to think about questions of naming as you're looking at this. I mean, does he look like a Nathaniel Jackson? That's interesting. This is uh, uh, Larry's father, Nathaniel Jackson, in 1985. And then, of course, he has on the video uh, his sons in particular, which I thought was interesting. But sort of this all can go into the question of naming. And so when I read the, the text, this is what I do. I call these different things. I take out the pictures. I move text. I tweet parts of text that I think are really interesting. All right, so ultimately, what does this mean? Um, we, I asked you earlier, like, how do people read? What is the digital humanities? And what does this have to do with you, right? I think ultimately, this ha what this has to do with you is that we have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we think about um, teaching t text with technology and reading and ex responding in the digital age. And that instead of us being consumers, like instead of us, like I think, and this is what they do at Morehouse, they think about, well, should we buy the iPad? I mean, what are people going to do with this? Because they gave everybody iTunes cards too. And they're like, you know, they're just going to go buy music and play Angry Birds. Like nobody's going to go and <laughs> do anything, right? And I think that instead of being these consumers, I mean, the focus is always on the creation. Like, what are you, like, how are you creating a new narrative? So I think that one of the things that's really interesting that on top of uh, Larry's book, like, I have a family history that's sort of existing um, side by side. And so one of the things that I, I was telling the people at Morehouse that the iPad, instead of being something to consume content, it becomes a way to create it. The big paradigm shift with iPads and education that is the big uh, paradigm shift. So instead of the iPad being what it was for Apple and Steve Jobs even initially, which is a place to sell iTunes content, it is now becoming an essential part of the dialogue itself. The apparatus is made visible, which is what happens in you know, any kind of postmodern uh, meta-narrative, right? The, the way in which it's created becomes like sort of the primary thing. And I think that we are all writers in the narrative. What, what happens is that at the end, you allow everybody to tell your story. And I find that, you know, particularly students, everybody wants to be heard. Like, they want to have their stories heard. And 
And, and this doesn't even have to be something you grade, which becomes like this uh, challenge. Like they're just like, what kind of grade am I going to receive on that? But it is something that just allows them to be engaged. And so many of my colleagues, I mean, because we're all male, African-American college, um, they're always looking at, at this sort of question of, you know, the sort of most precious cargo, which is black males who drop out of college the most, they come to college the least, they have all these sort of challenges. How can you get them more engaged, make sure that they, they have the grades to stay? So it's always becoming this question for us. And um, we've sort of looked at, we just had a conference on educating black males um, done by my colleague Brian Marks, who's in psychology, but it was what we keep, we kept getting back to is not only engagement, but you have to give people the chance to, to tell their stories. Like story became the, the main um, narrative of that conference. So Storify, I mentioned this is a platform. It's only two years old. I think that it's awesome. They, um, it, it allows you, as I, this is from their website, to create uh, stories using social media. So you turn what people post on social media into compelling stories. So as opposed to being this big distraction, this, like are you on Facebook, like what are you doing? It becomes a way for people to collect the best posts, you know, video tweets and more and publish them really as these simple, beautiful stories that can be embedded really sort of anywhere. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this is my grandmother who everybody says I look like on her. You're right. Um, so going back to Storify, so one of the things that um, becomes really interesting, so I have all this stuff about my family, about Lawrence's family, especially in the video. Is it <clears throat> All right, and then I sort of said at the end of this, because it was an interesting, because I hadn't always used Storify. There's a lot of other things I use, like Pinterest, I don't know, or Pin Interest, I'm not sure how you say it. But that's, I think I can show you that too. It's, um, a lot of people just use it, you know, to put together party ideas or stuff like that. But you can put together, you can use it as a collaborative way to get together ideas. I mean, all kind of ideas. Like, especially if students work together, they have some kind of new project. Pinterest is very useful because then that's a place where they can pin uh, web pages, different ideas, PDF files, and it sort of all exists there so you can see how they're working. Um, and I said that for at the very, very end, um, and this was about uh, narrative, which you can go read, but uh, the, the last part I said is that there is room for everyone to participate in the story, whether black or white, whether from Danville or elsewhere. And now that you have participated in the telling of the story by taking pictures and notes here um, and talking about it in class or with each other, and especially if you live, you, you live tweeted this, which some of you did, you understand that you, that you are the digital humanities. It's not something that happens to you or around you. It's happening through your very reading of text. So this is, I think, ultimately the point that I wanted to make. And I kind of just used, uh, I wanted to talk more about uh, Larry's book, and I hope you get it. But uh, I just wanted to, to show you the way that I'm reading. And then if you go on the Storify, you can sort of see more detail about the text. All right, and this is what made me think about this also at the College Language Association, this, was that this past month too. Um, the keynote speaker, Pearl Clegg, said, despite what Gil Scott Heron said, the re revolution is being televised. Like, that we live in this age where everything is digital. Um, so we are the archives, the creators, the artists, and the students, the educators. Teaching text, you know, with technology is not a fad. And this is just um, Pinterest, and I can send this to people. I just have, um, and I did this particularly for people at Morehouse. It's just a collection of different websites I use in teaching from the iPad, which are really kind of interesting. I mean, I take pictures of all my students. I can send them their grades, like, immediately. It's really kind of neat. Um, so, but it was a way to call ideas um, about how to do that. And that's it, so thank you. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter, as I said, Bob Claiborne and Claiborne Girl. All right, that's it. <laughs> and there, if there are questions. metaphors and all of this. So so storify, you right. take social media and you make a narrative. Right. right. And thinking about things in a meta-narrative way right. or
dialogic, which is a word that comes out of novel settings. Right. right. Like, what do you, what do you make of the fact that, that it's problematic? Yeah, and so we have this huge <coughs> shift, but we're still dependent on narrative. Yeah, metaphor. Literary, metaf you know, literary studies metaphor. I don't have any answer. I'm just curious for something. But I don't think that's a problem. Like I think that there are problems. <laughs> I think that everything in in my discussion of Song of Solomon, I said this, that ultimately everything comes back to story. And I think that um, yes. when I mentioned what the even when reading um, uh, Lawrence Jackson's book and thinking about um, what the students do when they want to be engaged with text. I mean, the fact that people need story is, is useful and that they need metaphors are useful. And I think that, um, I don't, I don't kind, of, kind of problematize it. I know that everything comes out of literary study, studies, but I think this is particularly important in this move towards sciences, whatever that means, like in this STEM world that we live in. Um, that, that to claim everything as story becomes really important. Yeah. Like, and when I was talking to this guy in math, he was saying that the same thing. Like, you have, you know, numbers are a story. Like, everything is a story. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. So, so kind of to, to constantly highlight the importance of narrative just right. reinforces our importance right. in the humanities. And I think that that's one of the things, I mean, um, at the, you know, Bible beginning was at the, you know there was the word there's a sense that you know whatever people are trying to talk about and it doesn't mean anything and I think that one of the things that um, I was also talking to some of my students about and who are majoring because I teach composition as well like who are majoring in business like they're like oh I'm majoring in business and I'm, this guy told me the other day he's like I'm gonna be a billionaire I was like you know, go be a billionaire like that's like that's what you want to do like why won't you do that right um, but I was like but what does that mean? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, how are you going to be a billionaire? Is that just mean you're going to have a billion dollars? But, I mean, why do you want to do that? Like, what do you want to do? And then he said he started, after he had this conversation, other than the fact that he knew he wanted money because he came from a place where he didn't have any, he went and he um, started researching billionaires, right? Like, on his own. Like, he's like, let me see what they did. Like, I think he was really trying to see if they went to college, like, so he could have this, like, oh, I don't really need college kind of to be a billionaire thing. But he put together this video. It was like so fabulous. Like he came back to me like I have a whole video, and I wrote this. And, like I make them write a blog and um, composition. And, like I wrote, he wrote it on a blog about these billionaires and how he came to understand that they had these commonalities, and and it became a story for them. And and, and I think that he will go off and be in business and do that. But now it's going to have sort of more meaning to him ultimately. I hope he is a billionaire. I was like, give money back. Everyone else now needs it. Our Wi Fi is shaky too. It's like worse than this. So. All right, last uh, question. First, thanks again for the presentation. Um, one thing that we face with HPW when we define it as digital humanities and what we really mean is the actual digital components, they're pretty much useless without the self moderating aspect of the community that right. people actually follow. So we. It's, you know, it's a sustained engagement. You typically have to continue to post, continue to uh, right. but let people moderate themselves. So I'm curious as to when the class ends, how many people still follow when people go with the dialogue? Well, th that's interesting. They still follow me, mm -hmm. but the question is, like, are they sort of shifting in, in what their attention goes to? And I, and I see, and this is a problem, too. Like, I've begun telling students, it's like, okay, literally, you need to have more than one Twitter account because I don't want to know about whatever girl you're seeing, like, like they start tweeting stuff, like, I really feel like I just cannot know about, like, it's just problematic, and then they want to have friends on Facebook and things like that, right? Like, if they have, like, this shift in the way that they sort of view me. But I find, interestingly enough, like, even today, I tweeted out some stuff, and people tweeted me back, I'm like, oh, really? You're talking about that? That's so interesting. Or, you know, I, one of the pictures was my dad uh, playing basketball. They're like, I didn't know you're dead. Like, so, so they engage in stuff like that. But I think that it does have people going out thinking about that. And that's one of the things about archives, too. Like, you know, the purpose is not to just to keep it, to keep it. I mean, it really is for a community, right? It really is to sort of, for people to use um, and not to be something like some of the repository. Like, you know, where now, you know, people can't even get into Howard Thurman's sort of collection. It has to be like something that people can go and do and see. And I think community is really important. And I and I think that particularly with African Americans, and I'll say this, that they do tend to be more engaged 
and continued ongoing, if it's available. And what I found that actual blogs are not useful. Like, they never go on those, like, ever. Like, if there's a website or a blog, you can forget it. So it has to be something that, um, that reaches out to them. So Instagram, which I just started getting into, <laughs> But that's somewhere where you can put hashtags too. Like so, if I put put teach text, it'll be up there, and you can just snap pictures from it. Like it takes out words for a lot of people, which is a challenge when they want to post something in a blog, and it's just like you know the world through pictures. But more people like respond if you say I took a picture of this uh, conference, and they're like, hey, well, what's that about? Like, what did you talk about? And then you have sort of a moment to engage in them in that way, and then they'll go. Then you put the link to the blog, and then they'll go there, right? It's like a miracle. It's like, but if the blog is just there, and nobody visits. And I, that's why I think Twitter is more, uh, because it's more immediate. And I think that what a lot of people, I think, make the mistake of using Twitter like a, um, like it's email, like like people are talking directly to them. It's like really you don't have to participate. And that's why what's so neat is the search aspect, the hashtag, like the fact that you can narrow down the conversation and only listen to the part where you know you want to listen to. So I don't have to listen to the cake saying this was this weekend, whatever, because that really doesn't have anything to do with me. I made a mistake of doing that once, but then I'm like, you know, put a hashtag in there or put at Prof. Claire Morton, I know you're talking to me, and then I'll pay attention. Like everything else that, it can, it can be, that's why I think they call it the back channel. Like you can have all of this stuff running, but you get to decide when and where you enter. And the important thing is that you can meet people there, that you can bring back outside. So the idea is that they're not gonna stay there, that they're gonna have, and I think a lot of people are like me, they, they have, they engage in text in a lot of ways. Like I, like I, you know, get the ebook. Like I have the ebook of decoded, and then I also have the book book. You know, I I, I do that a lot um, to make sure that I'm engaging in a lot of things. Um, one of the things that came up in our exchange um, was the pacing. That is one of the differences when you're talking about reading is that people read differently because they don't read in this continuous flow necessarily. Right. You you, you break it up. You look at it in other modes. But you're still reading. Right. But you're not reading in the same way. And it certainly are you reading more than snippets, perhaps. You put something down. And that and I, I was telling Amy the statistic I saw was that most people are using their continuous reading uh, time on airplanes. Right. And that is when the longest chunk of time that you're reading takes place. And I've been doing anecdotal evidence gathering. <laughs> uh, when I when I fly now, I just walk up and down the aisles and note from people who are glued to their Kindles or whatever. Right. Um, but, but, but this is the implication question I, I, that I want to ask about. Um, and I guess it gets into the area of the, the, the bad versus the good you know, right. uh, on this. Given that we're teaching college students who come to us already highly self-absorbed, <laughs> um, are we advancing promoting that self-absorption? with these forms of social media, right. which, and, and by your own description, what it is they talk about. <laughs> <laughs> my life, my life, me, 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 me. Uh, I don't, I'm not interested in that, but you have the right to say that because you're the teacher. But their friends are very much engaged in it. Right. And so transferring that practice over to an academic use uh, is sometimes problematic. So anyway, that, that was a bunch of questions, but it is, how do we get away from that side of it? I mean, are we really creating a community, or are we creating a more self-absorbed constituency? Yeah. I, but you're not, well, I, my argument is that you're not creating it. So my thing is, um, I deal with whatever comes. And so that is, and I think that that is the big difference. And I, and I said, especially with African-American males, we find that, you know, at Morehouse, like they have these, Kenton can tell you about it. You want to tell them about the five wells of, being a more houseman, I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> I mean, the idea, like, essentially, and this is how a lot of black colleges were, that you are forming this new individual, which maybe that's how the humanities started out in general. Like, you were supposed to create, like, better people. And I mean, maybe in the days when, you know, like, I always think about, like, with Socrates and Plato, and people taught, like, an old fashioned model, you know, where, you know, people go live. Like, you, if you want to learn from Socrates, you go to his house, right? Like, you would live with him instead of just feed and be like, impart knowledge, you know, great one, right? But 
I don't know if that happens to you. I haven't had any students come to me, like, you know, sit at my feet and want to, you know, want to learn. And so what I've understood is that I cannot create, I cannot sort of go back in time. As much as I would like to have a different <coughs> model of education, I don't know if I can necessarily remake a man. Like, if you're supposed to at Morehouse, you're supposed to be well-read and well-dressed and well-spoken. Like, yeah, maybe with the well-spoken, I can help out a little bit. <laughs> but, and, and they, but literally, they have this engagement where, you know, they have a dress code, and if they have a hat on, I'm supposed to tell them, you're like, look, you're not supposed to wear a hat, because you don't have to think about everything that they say about black males. You have to be well-dressed, you have to present, which I sometimes do and sometimes don't, or they're not supposed to wear their pants real low. Um, all of this to come in the other classroom, like I'm supposed to legislate this, because the idea is that we are molding this individual. But I think that we all sort of know that, okay, yeah, they'll do this for the time being, but does that mean when they leave, they don't have a hat on and their jeans aren't on the ground, as somebody you know said, you know, pants on the ground, which is the song. Like, like the, this is, I, I, don't, I don't know if we change that. I think they still have pants on the ground. So my thing is, do we spend the energy? I mean, of course we have to model, like, they shouldn't do this. They should, they should be engaged. They shouldn't be self-absorbed. They should come to us. They should want you know, what we have. But I think in some ways that if we can meet them where they are, they'll be more likely to sort of want to come out of that self-absorption. And I think that what happens is when, even on something like Twitter, or um, blogs such as that they never go to. Um, one of the things that I've seen is the way that they comment on each other's work. And that has forced them to get out of like, oh, this is what I'm doing and what my grade is and all this other stuff and sort of participate mm -hmm. in, um, in um, what other people are doing. So I don't, I don't know if there's any uh, way that we can go back to being beyond self-absorbed. I think there was a study that they said more women sleep with their laptop than <laughs> with a man or something like that. It's just like our, with a woman or any other human being, like they're more comfortable with technology. So that could be um, saying something about our society in general. Yeah, well, I want to come in on the self-absorption part, uh, particularly me thinking about like the New York Times reading room. Yeah. Um, how you have people coming on these articles. Well, it's, it's really self-absorbed too because people bring their own, own perspectives in it. And I guess we could say that even sitting around in some conversations, People are so totally not open to this theory, not open to that theory. Right. However, you showed us a few resources on here, so I'm thinking about, you know, maybe three specific ways that you spark this type of dialogue, there where people are bringing in these different viewpoints in class, like on Twitter, if it's using the hashtag or if it's what have y'all just wondering about three specific maybe ways that you do spark um, this dialogue to show how we're kind of having conversations and actually producing new knowledge using this. Well, I think you already said it. I mean, I think that hashtags definitely do that. I mean, but I think that there's always a, you know, like, like a tell us. There's something outside of Twitter. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's always some bigger dialogue. So the idea is that I could talk about all these, you know, things about literary theory and stuff on Twitter, but the, the way that sort of is home to people is when they come and they talk about it. They talk about music that they're listening to, right? Which, you know, which is an interesting thing for me. I mean, you know, I listen to hip hop, but I don't, I'm not like on whatever is new. So like I got brought a lot of new music I never heard, but I sort of engaged in, in that conversation. And so they, the students want to, you know, go off and have, and I have no doubt that they're going to have this conversation in another way. I mean, in, in um, 2000, but no, in, in, in uh, September, there's going to be the Woodruff Library of the Atlanta University Center is sponsoring a Tupac conference, right, that is supposed to be looking at hip hop, the life of Tupac, which, you know, if you know anything about Coachella, they just had like this hologram of him performing, which a lot of people were talking about, you know, being this sort of interesting moment right there. But, um, but really they're talking about hip hop in the academy too, like, I mean, this idea that you know, whether or not people like it or not. I mean, it's something that, that's a real discipline that uh, people are studying. So it's going to be this interesting moment where, you know, again, we'll have students having that conversation. And I think a lot of the students create music too. So I think it has something to do with the type of music that they will then create. And whether it's going to be like just some, some you know, nonsense or if it's going to be something that's going to actually use good metaphor and say something. I think something um, else that you said that was really, really important that um, I've been thinking about ever since you presented it, but um, the the idea of the postmodern discourse and um, digital scholarship, right? right? And I think um, 
more needs to be explored about the continuity of those two areas that I don't really see in the forefront. So even beyond hip-hop theory, right? Right. Because you presented it in the context of hip-hop theory of James Baldwin and Jay-Z, but it goes beyond that space. And I think what's happening in the academy, like I've said plenty of times before, so I'll just repeat it again, <laughs> is that we don't really look at what's really the new new, right? Because right. We're, we're so steeped within our discipline and our history that we don't really get to examine the evolutionary changes that happen between technology and individuals, right. which happen at a much greater pace than people even leaving graduate school. Right. It's going to change over the course of you being in graduate school. So we do right. need more scholarship um, that, that shows the continuity between this uh, technological evolution and postmodernism. Oh, I mean, definitely. And I think that, well, one of the things is that, you know, looking in, like, I'm also working in a faculty development center, so we're talking about the ways, you know, just pedagogical approaches with technology and things like how it's changed. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I mentioned, like, people used to sit at the feet of the professor. Like, you, you have to think that, you know, the book itself was like this revolution in technology mm -hmm. for a lot of people and how that made them change. And as much as people groan and say, well, I don't want to learn that new, right? Ultimately, they had to, and uh, they had to sort of go on with that scholarship. But I think that the same thing, I think that we will have to talk about it. So you're saying that people don't talk about the new, new. Like I said, Storify is something new that I've just been using this semester. Like, I'm sure there's going to be, it's like, it was last year, it was like the big startup at South by Southwest. So next year, it's going to be something else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they'll say, well, okay, Storify can do this, but can it? Like, one thing I don't like about Certified, like, it should be able to just present, like, Keynote or something like that. Like, you can mm -hmm. just swipe through the slides, but you can't do that yet. But I think that eventually that you probably can. I mean, you send it to the developers, and they usually kind of respond to that. But mm -hmm. one of the things I want to uh, make a, a note of this, and I think that this is important to bring it back to um, Lawrence Jackson's book, and partly why I wanted to talk about this, is that a lot of my students, it, it, especially in, unless I'm teaching a class in autobiography, which I think you were saying that you taught as well, or, um, you know, or if it's in history or something like that, are not going to read this book. They're like, oh, you know, I don't know, it's not interesting. Well, with Amber, who, where is that? Like, why should I even want to read a story about this place, Pennsylvania County? I don't know anything about that. What I find is that I, the, the ability to, to expand people's, to get them to look at new ways of seeing and new books mm -hmm. is exponential. So, like, I might have come in through Jay-Z, but they will leave, you know, having read, hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. um, his book, having read Ellison, you know, mm -hmm. having read Morrison, having read, you know, all of the people that he brings up, um, sort of in his study. Um, like they'll have this access to that, and a lot of times I demand that of them. Like this is just the first thing, but then we, you have to read widely. You have to know about more about the world. Yeah. So I think that the you know postmodern scholarship people will start to have to have that discussion. How can these sort of new things get you back into the you know the old stories and the old narratives? I mean. We were talking about this, Kent and I, like, you know, they still have to take Chaucer. Right? They still take, you yeah, know, the students are required, or Chaucer, Milton, and Shakespeare. And so, you know, the question is that you can't just say, well, that's just Chaucer, Milton, and Shakespeare. You have to say, well, okay, how can this be relevant to you? Because they don't want to read it most times. Not that Chaucer's not great, but I mean, that's just one of those things. Um, so how do you make that, like, interesting? And I think that this is a way to do that. And I think that there are people, especially back in the very interested in doing that. Questions, anyone? Um, I don't have a Kindle, I have an older Kindle. And I find I have a difficulty interacting with the text. Really? The Kindle, because, first of all, I have very fast fingers. And so I can't take notes because I can't. So, like, the, right. The Right. I, I can't stand the fact that they were want to have page numbers. Oh, I know. So that is that's why. I, right. And so, you know, and obviously Kindle doesn't have academic books. So you can't get some academic books. Some, but have you tried to suggest that they get them? No, you I think have I mean. Well, I've requested and they've never. Oh, really? Said, never so. Said anything. 
for the most part, I just right. can't really get a lot of, you know, a lot right. of things books you can't get. Well, and then what's it's interesting, <laughs> some of them, um, Pearson, for example, which is a publisher we use a lot, they have their own app. So whereas the books might not be available through Kindle, you can download it. It's, you should check. I don't know. Like, um, I know that um, Bedford St. Martin's doesn't necessarily have a lot. I've just figured out a composition, but <clears throat> on um, ebooks, but a lot of them do, and they're sort of moving that way. And then what's so interesting, which is the second part of this, which I'm supposed to be doing this summer, with the iBix author, you can make your own books, right? Like, you can. I, I don't know how permissions are going to work yet, but say that you can find a way to either scan things in and create your own book that's available to students. You can write like a introductory chapter of it and sort of put it together as a textbook set of other people. So it'll be an interesting, um, it'll be an interesting, you know, transitional period to see how that, that's going to change, like with the books on Kindle, especially. I found myself just like, oh, going back to the back of the books because I can't, like I felt like I couldn't. But literally, there's no way that, I was just, you know, well, Lawrence Jackson's Indignant Generation, which is, you know, 600 pages, is not on, it's not an ebook. but I was like literally getting on the plane thinking, if I had to carry every book that I'm reading or considering right now, I would not be very happy because it's literally, I mean, if you thought about like all these sort of texts I pulled from, like in this sort of short space on the salad, his book, the, you know, Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, if I was going to go through all of that. But I have them all on my Kindle. And there's another book that I'm teaching um, called, uh, oh God, the, the woman, Tanana Redu, is a visiting professor at Spelman, which is right across the way from Morehouse. Uh, she's the Cosby Endowed Chair, actually, uh, by Soul to Keith. And so I'm teaching the book, right? And, you know, I've read it before, and I have a copy. It's all marked up. It's lovely. But so this time, you know, that I, I, I but with me, I have to go back and teach when I go back. I just have it on the ebook, and it's just so great. Like, I didn't have to lug all of that stuff. Student papers, too. I, I'm to the point where I don't, I don't do paper. I can grade. There's something called Goodreader. If you go on my printer's page, you can see you could actually mark on the, the the paper just like you would if you got it in a hard copy and send it back to them in email. Like you don't really have to get a stack of uh, papers, which is so lovely that you don't have to lug around with you on vacation if you've ever done that, which sucks, right? So you're at the beach like ah, I got student papers that are green, right? So no, they're like all on there. You make your comments. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying yeah. for myself, I find it like if I. I, I use it just to read the books that I yeah. know I know I will never teach, and just kind of I you know I hate to say like the I don't want to say fun reading because but, the other but yeah, I teach no, them is the different they are fun reading, but you know it's um, just for me I just had different right. Reading. But I think that, and then you don't have to. This is my argument. Like you don't have to do an ebook like at all. For me, it just makes more sense. Like for other people, it might not. And I think that one of the things that I don't want people just to use to be techy because just for tech's sake, like just, well, they said I got to do it, so I'm just going to find a way. But like literally, um, it like, for me, it transformed my teaching in the sense that like I, I do have all the hard copies, but I find that I am so loath in some ways to go to them other than to like transfer notes or something that I had from the original. Um, it depends on what it is. Like something like certain texts, you will always like like that. But I think that uh, the way that it can integrate with so many other things, it becomes, you know, like I said, it just becomes so much easier. I, I have another question because it, again, it sparked what you the description just now. Almost in everything you said, you talk about starting with print. Right. So you have the hard copies. You have the notes and hard copies. Right. But then you transfer. What about people? culture women now who do not start from print. Are you saying we still need to start people from print? Or should we should no, 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 I'm not saying that. Start I'm saying that we have not <coughs> reached the, uh, particularly in our case, like for example, if you were, if, if everybody got a laptop or some kind of device yeah, coming into Morehouse, like if they were all starting at the same age, then I think that we could require that. And actually they said you can't require it. And then 
so much like that's paid for to do it. I don't know how that's gonna work, but um, <clears throat> but we don't have that. So the, some people borrow a copy from their friend because that's all they have, or they, two people share a book because they're broke. And so the re, the reality is that you you still have to start from there. Like you, I I don't think that we're in a place where we can only require okay. um, ebooks, even though I prefer. That. And then and a lot of times the students are the ones to say, well, why? why so you have to continue to encourage the starting from print. Right, and then there, we're not to the point where everything is in. But like I said, there, you know, nowadays, you could just make PDF copies of stuff, and you know, as long as it's in, yeah. the, you know, Creative Commons, and the intellectual property, you know, laws within the 10% or however much it's supposed to be, like, you could still do that. And um, I find that, uh, you know, for me, you know how people used to make, I don't know if you still do, like course packs and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, we use Blackboard here, so we pretty much have access, you know. Uh, well, and see, that's stuff. our problem. A lot of things that more, uh, more houses are work around <laughs> because we still have WebCT, which Blackboard bought like several years ago and then stopped developing. So our ours is like back, 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 and back. And, and, and half the time it doesn't work, and it's sort of really so. Most of the time, what we're trying to figure out to do is how to do that when you don't have stable like learning platform. Questions, anybody? I, I was just curious. I'm sorry to come in late. I have to uh, teach, um, but I, I'm curious how uh, in this that you incorporate uh, uh, sort of. Uh, documentaries film because so much of learning even for my dinosaur generation was a, a visual culture and we are sort of returned to parts of the more visual cultures than purely text culture I right how you incorporate that into the kind of I mean you can the, the amount of things that are on YouTube are like kind of astounding right. when um, sometimes they're broken down into nine minute bites, but you can see most of everything. I mean, I was remembering, I was looking for this movie in the 70s with John Boyd called Conrack about uh, based on Pat Conrad's Wonder is Why. They've never made it into a DVD. You can't really get it anymore. It's like really hard. But I found the whole thing on YouTube, like, you know, and um, which is sort of like a fabulous thing. And, I mean, you didn't hear from me. There's a lot of ways in which you get, um, not so legally, but if it's for the purposes of education, you could uh, upload video from DVDs and stuff like that into something like yeah. Storify or right. Upload a website. Part mm -hmm. to, I think in our, our eGAR, you can upload about five the 10 minute segments yeah. of the oh, I, Yeah, I don't know what the, because, I mean, like I said, you didn't hear from but me, you, but I you know over, that, it, you know. If you go over 10 minutes, then it's sort of, like, uh, you're getting into that. Uh, but see, I don't know, because I can remember if that was also the case if you were only showing it to the class, like, I, I got to do with all lawyers or whatever, because there, there have been times where I just, you know, the video is not, it's not on YouTube. But, but I'm I just wondering class, how you I think mm -hmm. these, Cinematic, to use that word, in the textual interact in Creek. I'll just give you a story. Last semester, I taught a course on black men, and I, I used think like a man to yeah. sort of start the course off. Oh um, wow! Uh, well, because it had all kinds of gendered assumptions in it, yeah. right? Yeah, that's the one way to say it. Well, yeah, but you you talking about taking yeah, where yeah. they are, and let's analyze what. What are the gender assumptions mm -hmm. in this text? Right. And then move on to other texts uh, right. uh, that are, are, are uh, autobiographies and memoirs of black men. Right. And, um, and, and I found using both film and text was a way of grabbing my students into the, to the discussion. And I was wondering how, how you thought about that as an uh, overall media strategy as opposed to just one kind of... No, I mean, it definitely is a media strategy. And what I've found is that even when I don't bring media to, like, a discussion students will, they'll find it. And they'll bring in clips. And they'll put... And, and I think that's one of the things. Like, they'll post it on Twitter or put it on their website, and they will say, well, have you seen this? Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, that sort of this question of black malehood, um, we were talking, students and I, about the fact that... Um, 
in the last year, like the biggest roles for black women were played by black men, right? Like <laughs> Medea and uh, what was that? Oh, Big Mama, right? Big Mama. So there's this moment. And I was like, well, how does that change this maleness? But then students, because I, I didn't have clips, I didn't even see the movies. So I'm like, I was striking from Cal Perry. That's another <laughs> but, um, and you didn't mind it, too. <laughs> I, I know. And, um, but they did. They sort of had these clips, and they were talking about it. And then they brought in things from Flip Wilson. And we had like a really interesting, like they found it. Like that wasn't even anything I had to go and tell them about. Like, oh, do you know about Geraldine? Have you looked at all these other kinds of things? Like they sort of did their own search and came up with that. So I do think that that strategy is great. And it's, 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 I, I see it as the way that they think anyway, like sort of this media plus the text and how they come together. But you're saying you explained the conversation. That's what you're doing. You're right. Like you're opening this up to more and more, not only modes, but also getting students really into stuff that, that, is pre, that predates the digital. Right. It enters into the digital. Right. Way. So, I know we're running into a, a time. I'm got sorry. People have the next plan. I just want to thank you. I don't know if you have some, some prepared comments to, but I'll say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even call it my day. Like, I just wanted to be here. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back over to him. All right, well, again, I'd like to say thank you for coming. And I'd also like to say conversations do not end here. If you would check us out on project hbw.blogspot.com or hbw.ku.edu, you will see that we're having these ongoing conversations and interactive and developing new interactive uh, modes of thinking about African American literature and novel history. So again, would you all please join me? Thanks, everybody. There is lunch still, so please wait.